So I'm going to talk about image editing using generative adversarial networks. In the last uh, years, um, there are many competitors in the area of generative models. Generative adversarial networks uh, are, uh, have been one of the best models for many years now, but very recently we saw strong competition from two other models. For example, I mean, the two models are various types of diffusion models and various types of autoregressive models using transformer. A bit behind in quality, I would say, are flow models and variational autoencoder that are not really competitive, I would say, at the moment with these three other models. However, it is also important to consider that many current models use a mixture of different types of uh, concepts. So you could see models that use a variational autoencoder inspired compression into a discrete latent space, also using a GAN loss, and then in a compressed latent space, you would have an autoregressive model using a transformer. So that means that distinction is no longer that clear because of this mix and match uh, architecture building that's going on at the moment. But this talk, I'll mainly focus on generative adversarial networks. But just so you have some idea what others are doing, Here's the DALL-E2. Uh, now, I cannot verify this. These are just um, things people posted and one of my students found them. So I cannot really say if these were truly generated by DALL-E2, but you see, for example, on the right, a dramatic depiction of Elon Musk buying Twitter and DALL-E2 can from some text give you an image and uh, this is more like a painting style image of a human, but on the left, you see maybe the type of human that DALI2 can generate. And DALI2 is, I would just take as representative of a very strong diffusion model at the moment. For generative adversarial networks, if we go in there, then, uh, Right now, the big distinction would probably be between 2D GANs and 3D GANs. And this talk mainly focuses, focuses on 2D GANs, even though if you followed the literature, you saw a lot of papers coming out within the last half a year that tried to generate first a volumetric nerve style representation that is then being rendered. And so the idea is that the GAN would generate a 3D representation itself. There are many uh, choices and I just list some of them. I think this is not exhaustive of what was done within the last half a year or so. Gram, style nerve, style SDF, volume GAN, SIPS 3D and EG 3D. And I highlight EG3D because I would pick it as the currently best model. So here are some results from EG3D. You can see that the generated faces are just a bit less in quality than the faces generated from a 2D GAN. However, in addition, you do have a 3D representation in the back that gives you maybe a better understanding, a better semantic interpretation of the space. Now, this will be work going on now and you already see editing papers, of course, coming out with 3D GANs, but for now we stick with 2D GANs for this talk, which is the work that was done primarily within the last 
two or so years. And I'll also focus on work done in my group. For 2D GANs, there are many options of what to pick. And I would say that almost uh, without competition, people work with the style GAN generator and versions of the style GAN generator. So the competing GAN architectures are simply different versions of the style GAN architecture, not so much uh, different types of architectures. The uh, style GAN architecture has three or four main versions, one, two, style GAN two, ADA, and style GAN three. What, but the question is if style GAN three is really better than style GAN two. It has a lot of interesting features that can be useful, but I would say for now, the agreement is still that style GAN two ADA is the best 2D generator specifically for faces and faces are the first and dominant application when it comes to generate the federal serial networks. And still there's a choice of which implementation to use. So there's TensorFlow versus PyTorch or original versus some re-implementation. So there are going to be a lot of um, details to consider there. However, uh, many people would now pick StyleGAN2 or StyleGAN2 ADA. And so most of the editing results that were published, they are built on StyleGAN2 uh, or StyleGAN2 ADA. All right, so, so let's look at some GAN images. This is one example of the GAN generated image that can be achieved by StyleGAN2. This is another example. And you can see that there's this blurred background mimicking some uh, portrait photography. And then the foreground has a very nice face with all sorts of details. And the image to an untrained observer or layperson looks more or less indistinguishable from a photograph. So as comparison, these are virtual humans. These are 3D models generated and rendered. Uh, these also look pretty good now, uh, but probably still a bit too clean and they don't have uh, some of these uh, noise uh, features or variations that are present in uh, GAN generated images. Let's look at the GAN architecture and uh, while GAN Against they need a generator and a discriminator. I will not mention anything about the training of the GAN, you know, how does the GAN learn or how does the discriminator look like? I will only talk about the generator because the generator is what people use for editing. So this is a very old generator, I think from 2015 from Rashford but I'll just use it to illustrate the concept. What you see is basically an input way to the left. These are 100 random values. And as output, you get a 64 times 64 times three way on the right RGB image. So that was 2015. And what happened to get from this one, 100 dimensional vector to this image is that the architecture had a lot of convolutions and upsampling operations. And so uh, this is pretty much still the concept that's uh, dominant today. So in some sense, this uh, part that the generator, it looks like an inverse classification network or if you're hopefully familiar with all the dense regression tasks such as segmentation or depth estimation that are built on this unit encoder decoder architecture the generate this very similar to a decoder. And um, 
one other part of the architecture is what is called a mapping network. And in this mapping network, you start, and this is now the StyleGAN version, you start with a random vector set that has 512 components. And all these FC are fully connected layers. So this is a multi-layer perceptron with eight layers that takes one input vector Z and maps it to one output vector W. So the difference here is that the input to the net mapping network is the vector Z where each of the 512 components are sampled randomly. So there's no relationship between two components and no component really knows what the other one is doing. They're really generated completely independently. But after going through this uh, fairly deep mapping network, we have a W code where the variables have some knowledge about each other. So the idea of such a mapping network is that the W code really tells you all the information you need to know about a single face. And now we're gonna basically go back and modify this basic convolutional generator so that it uh, not only works with a random vector as input, but it works with a W vector that can control how the um, generator functions. So now what we see again to the right, and this is now the more appropriate style again, uh, generator that not only goes to 64 squared images, but it outputs a resolution of 1024 squared. And again, this is RGB. And what the choice is that, uh, the choices are for this architecture design is what information do you basically insert way at the beginning that was this maybe set vector way in the beginning and what information do you insert at each convolutional layer so this is this green information here so the choice that Stalgen made was to have basically nothing that is input in the beginning, just a constant, and mainly rely on this information injected from the side um, that uh, is based on the W code. So let's look at how, how can you actually realize this? How can you insert global information or, or noise into, uh, into one particular layer? So there's uh, multiple ways to do this. And we'll just look at one uh, option here that is uh, option C. And what you see is there are these green blocks called conf blocks. These are regular convolutions. And as you know, a convolutional layer takes a tensor as input and gives you a tensor as output. So let's just imagine we have a 64 times 64 times 512 tensor as input, and a 64 times 64 times 512 tensor as output. And then how that means we have 512, what we call activation maps of size 64 squared. And how do each of these activation maps look like in the style again architecture, again, we stay with faces, they look something like this. So they, each of them look somewhat uh, similar to a face, but something highlighted. So you could interpret something in there. So if you look at the example to the right, looks like it has something to do with the eyes or the area under the eyes. And if you look at the example to the left, looks like it's something to do with a highlight on the head or maybe with the hairs. So either way, these, these convolutional layers, they process these tensors with lots of these activation maps. And then the way to inject information, uh, this is from this A block in here, is by modulating an activation map 
which means simply we take one activation web like this and we multiply it with a global scalar. So we make the whole map brighter or darker, basically. So this is how everything is put together now. Uh, again, this is the old architecture. So this is um, then the, how exactly this is injected is slightly different now. But overall, still you have the mapping network that you see on the left, where first you have this latent set that you through that you, you process with this MLP to get this global vector W. And this global vector W is then injected into every layer or every convolution before or after. And uh, this is how the thing is controlled. Now there's also a noise and the noise is injected differently. The noise is really injected per pixel, more or less. I mean, there are some details, but the noise is really just something to add spatial noise into all these activation maps. All right, so image generation itself is then often just written as a function G that takes an input W code and generates a 1024 squared RGB image. So you see image equals generation of W. So there's some question of how does the GAN exactly generate the images? So top down, maybe you imagine it generates something like some segmentation masks and then adds more details. Or maybe it says here are the eyes and then adds, adds some details for the eyes. Uh, or maybe it generates some 3D model and renders it somehow. That doesn't happen automatically unless you use a 3D GAN. Um, or maybe it has some sort of basis functions that uh, and that, that then are combined, similar to maybe the eigentraces concept. And the, the answer is that the GAN does not really generate the images in an easily human understandable manner. So if you look at all the intermediate information that the GAN processes, it is actually not that simple to come up with uh, editing operations that, that work really, really well. However, uh, you can get editing operations that work still quite a lot better than people expected just a few years ago. All right, so this would be some example person. And again, now, if you look at this person and the, the maps that we saw before, okay, so maybe you, 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 you thought, okay, this, yeah, this, this, you know, high, uh, values here around four, maybe these are some highlights, but then again, here you basically don't really see highlights or, you know, what does that correspond to? It doesn't, maybe the eyelids below, but it's kind of hard to see. And then why is this eye information packed together with something that goes over the shoulder down here? So it's a bit tricky, or you see maps like this. I mean, what is this right one? You have something about the, front teeth and something about the eye. So it's, it's not that clear. All right, so what operations can be performed? One fundamental operation is taking an RGB image and converting it back to a W code. So we wanna have some uh, operation that can do what I call embedding here. There are two ways to do this. One is optimization based and one is encoder based. That is you train a network architecture that takes an image as input and then outputs a W code. Um, so the embedding is a bit tricky because um, everything looks great if you look at it from a uh, um, distance far enough, but uh, things can start to look a bit weird when you really zoom in. So for example, if you look at the images in the top row, so the left is the input, and then you see the embeddings, different types of embeddings. Um, they look very similar on some level, but maybe if you zoom into the eyes, you see that the eyes look more realistic early on, maybe in the third column, but then in the end, the eyes, uh, the they kind of lost their shininess and they no longer look uh, very natural. 
see the same issue in the bottom. Um, so this embedding generally is a trade-off between how can you optimize the pixel-wise loss? So, so how close can you really get to the input image and uh, how semantically meaningful is it? So while the L2 error, pixel-wise error might be lower uh, in the end, here the overall quality is not that. So here's a comparison of different algorithms. And um, for a lot of them, especially when you look at them right now, you will see that uh, this is actually not that easy. If you look at it just for a very short time, then everything looks kind of okay, a little off, sometimes it's a lot more off. And so actually the analysis of the different embedding algorithms is a difficult problem by itself. And especially because there's this trade-off between semantic editing quality and uh, how similar does it look like to the input. Um, so people, including us, study different embedding spaces. And the W space is the most natural one, but very early on, and this is also what we did, is people figured out that the W space itself is not uh, powerful enough, but uh, you need to embed to some other spaces. So you actually have uh, more possible faces that you can encode. So this is uh, very early work, image to style again that uh, we worked on. And then what you see way on the left, if you go to this more extended space that we call W plus, uh, you can embed faces such as Obama, but you can also embed the cat and the dog and the painting and the car. And then um, the obvious conclusion is that, of course, you can embed faces nicely now, but the fact that you can embed other things should be not a great success, but more like a worry because the embedding cannot really be semantically meaningful. Again, trained on faces is not able to then manipulate the car. I mean, that seems uh, impossible. So and that means the space is kind of too expressive now. And it's also possible to just overfit and uh, embed some, some nonsense. So this is what people looked at, noise, which is the uh, part on the right, the Z, which is what goes into the mapping network in the beginning, W, which is the default output of uh, the mapping network. And W plus is simply if you go from the output of the mapping network, you see all these arrows going into these A boxes. And for default, the W code is simply replicated 18 times or something like 18 times here. And it's possible to split it into 18 different codes instead of having the same W code for each time the W code is injected. So that's what's called W plus. And then this W code goes through an, a fine layer. This is this A box here before it is used to modulate. And if we not use the W code before it goes into the fine layer, but we, we use the codes that come out after is a fine layer. These are more or less the scaling factors of the individual activation maps. This is called the style space. Now, another thing would be to kind of split the network somewhere in the middle. So let's say there's some upper part that you would see here in the lower part, you could cut the network and look at the output of one conf layer somewhere in the network or some, some maybe some uh, modulation layer. And so this would be a tensor. Let's say it's a 64 times 64 times uh, 512 tensor. And you can say, okay, let's ignore everything in the generator before. You kind of cut the generator in half, ignore the first part of the generator and directly embed into these activation maps. And the other way to do embedding is to embed into the generator the weights themselves. So this would be the, uh, weights that the network has to control the conf layers. All right, so 
the straightforward interpolation of images is one editing operation that you can do now. So now it depends on what exact uh, embedding you use. So we'll, for this, we assume you, know, you kind of use the W code embedding. Uh, could be W plus or could be style space, uh, could also be tensors. Um, and so what you can do is then a simple linear interpolation of the W codes can give you an interpolation of images. And to make this one very explicit, you will have two RGB images. You would start by embedding the first image to get the first W code. Then you embed the second image to get the second W code. Then you do a linear interpolation. And then you use the generator G again to uh, generate an RGB image from this interpolated W code. So these are some early results. And uh, this is some more fancy uh, interpolation in style space. Uh, this is a paper style fusion from uh, Danny's group. And uh, what they try to do is not to do a simple interpolation, but basically use an MLP network to do a more fancy interpolation. So one example that you see here is the idea of uh, hairstyle transfer. So what you want is you want to interpolate the person way on the bottom left with each of the people on the top row. But in particular, you don't want just some arbitrary interpolation. You would like to have some interpolation where the face mainly stay, is kept from the person in the bottom left input and the hair is taken from the person on the top. And so what this tries to do is to find some interpolation of two latent codes where you know, one, one is mainly responsible for the hair and the other one for the face. And then you can see that this works reasonably well, not like super well, but it works reasonably well. And so these more intelligent interpolations or latent code combinations are possible. Now, semantic editing, um, there's the idea to learn just vectors in latent space. We'll just stick with W for now. So for example, WH, pose, smile, lighting. And then you can edit an image by adding vectors. So you start with the W code W, and then you add plus theta, where theta is the edit strength, another vector W smile. And this vector W smile is global that, that is used for all possible uh, images you want to edit. It's kind of a constant that, that you learn in a preprocess. And then you have the edited image WF. So uh, this is some version we worked on that not only uses a linear edit, but it uses a um, nonlinear edit using uh, normalizing flows. And you can see here, this is an edit for doing a pose change. And then if you look at uh, 3D GANs, what people work on now, uh, this pose change somewhat looks like plausible 3D, but it is not really, uh, consistent. So it, it's just like some illusion that's approximately 3D, but it is not really uh, a consistent 3D rotation or viewpoint change. So now instead of just doing embedding, you can actually do a lot of editing operations with something like conditional embedding. So for example, you see um, some three faces here, but here we only want to embed the left part of the face and the right part we um, want to keep free and we want the network to pick whatever it thinks is plausible. And so here we can use again the semantic information stored in again. And, and to do that, uh, you simply modify the loss a bit to have some sort of a uh, mass loss or there's a loss that uh, compares images after some transformation. And so you can get results like this, where um, you see the outputs of different algorithms. And in general, you know, even though there are differences, all of the GAN-based methods can do a good job of inventing a plausible second half of the face. And this is 
hard to do for other non-GAN-based in-painting algorithms. So this example is super resolution. Again, it's just some slight modification of the embedding loss where what you see in the second column is some, some input, the downsampled image, and then you want to generate the higher resolution image. In, in contrast to traditional super resolution, here you go really several uh, steps of uh, increasing by a power of two and not just uh, make the resolution two or four times larger. This is colorization. So again, the second column here is the input is a grayscale image. And then again, is able to give you a colorized output. Now, one question that, uh, so, so a lot of this work here is based by embedding, conditional embedding or manipulating the codes. Uh, so the question is, can we also just do copy paste image editing in uh, using games. So what you see here is an input person on the left. That is a man, young, young man, and then there is a woman to the right. And so what we wanna do is we wanna copy the hair from the man to the woman. And so this is a terrible result. We could just go and copy the pixels directly. But in some sense, so what we want to do is we want to maybe do this pixel copying, but we wanna do it in earlier, using the GANs, but using earlier layers. So if you see a generator network here, then maybe we can do some partial embedding. So, so we, or, or activation map embedding, we embed into this uh, part of the GAN where the resolution is 64 times 64. So we can do two, we can take two images, we can embed them and make them both 64 times 64, tensors in the uh, embedded into the GAN. And then we do pixel copying at this part. And, uh, and then we use the generator uh, to, to generate back the 1024 image. And the idea is that the generator will do an intelligent combination of uh, the pixel copying that kind of created some uh, ugly boundaries. And we hope that the other layers of the generator go back and fix it. And so we, we did this very early on with ProGAN in the paper TileGAN. And what you see is on the way on the left is some mountain that has, or is some, some, some aerial image that we have four different tiles that we copy together and you see very hard boundaries. You can slightly make it a bit nicer using graph cut, but if you actually use the GAN, and use the editing operations, pixel copying in earlier layers of the GAN, and then use the generator to fix the boundaries, you get very nice semantic blending uh, between the regions. And so basically, uh, there's an issue though with style GAN because of the W code that you need to control the later layers. So this, there was no global control in program but in style again, there is. So should we then use the W code from image one or image two? Uh, there are all sorts of these occlusion problems that possibly require in-painting and you, you kind of have to be careful to adjust the lighting and the colors. And so this is one thing we worked on in uh, Barbershop, but the basic idea is what I just explained. You wanna embed into somewhat halfway in the GAN I'll do the pixel copying operation there and then use the generator to generate the final result. Um, so here are some results. And what you see is a segmentation mask and uh, I'll skip it, but you just see the two inputs in column two and column three. And then there are the results of three competing methods with the last one is uh, the result of our map. So one last thing is how to use GANs for uh, domain adaption. So you have one original generator in domain A. Let's just say again, that generates regular faces such as this person on the bottom left. And what you want to do is you want to fine tune the generator so that it outputs similar faces, but in a different domain, for example, this uh, cartoon domain what you see on the bottom right. 
And uh, you know, one notable paper in, in August uh, last year was the uh, style Ganada, also from Dennis Group, where um, they just used purely text-based supervision. So you could say that, okay, we have a dog generator that created realistic dogs before, but we give a text prompt that says, you know, that the, the dog should look more like the Joker. And then there are going to be some losses. So, so this generator B should be fine-tuned such that the output is still similar. So there should be a relationship between whatever the domain A generate the outputs and whatever the domain B generate the outputs, but the domain, the style uh, should be taken from the text prompt. And this is done with some loss in click space. Um, and so we built on that for building more classical single shot domain transfer. And the interesting part is you can do a reasonable job fine tuning a generator using just a single image. So what you see on top are the realistic input images that we're gonna embed. And then on the first column, you see all the style reference images. And then uh, the results are shown row by row. And you can see that really the fine tuning is able to learn a different domain from a single input image. All right, we did some work for segmentation, skip. All right, we also skip. All right, let's uh, just skip to the end. So thanks for your attention and uh, maybe I can take some questions. Yeah, thanks, thanks Peter, very much for giving us a nice talk. You obviously give lots of potential applications uh, with, uh, by manipulating you know, GAN space. And any quick questions from the audience? Yeah, so I have a quick question. So you mentioned about this adaptive foundation, which you can sort of potentially manipulate different parts of the images to, to, you know, to control the generation. And that seems to imply that you know, the, these uh, aspects need to be disentangled. So is there any way, you know, how this, this is guaranteed and how, you know, if there are, you know, if it's disentangling, it's not perfect in any direction that can that's potentially be improved? Yeah, so, so exactly. So in some sense, what, what people want to do is uh, they, they would like to have an entangled representation. But there's a, I think there's a fundamental conflict that is the GAN needs to learn um, the relationship between different regions somehow. For example, the left earring looks more often than not the same as the right earring. No, it's not guaranteed, but more often than not, they are the same. And so the GAN needs to learn that. Or the left eye looks similar to the right eye and the hair everywhere is the same. And also the lighting, you can see that the GAN does a great job generating consistent lighting. So the lighting needs to be the same everywhere. And in some sense, the GAN could not possibly, in my view, create the perfect disentanglement that people think is necessary for editing. Because in editing, you wanna say, change the right eye to brown, don't care about the left eye, or just change the hair, but you need to make the lighting consistent somehow. And so uh, there's a lot of work and claims about disentanglement, but in some sense, I, I think there, there is no real fundamental insight except for the GAN is a bit disentangled, but not as much as you would like, and there's no solution to it. There's, and it's unclear if the solution is even possible or how yeah, far sure. you can push it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, clearly there are conflicts between a perfect generation and uh, you know, entire disentanglement that there will never be a, uh, you know, there will be, never be a perfect solution to address both sides. Um, yeah, I mean, from I think from a human observer uh, perspective, they may have some sort of judgment to see, okay, this is a good balance. How we can sort of learn a model that that that, that know how to uh, now knows how to achieve the balance can still be interesting, even if there's no 
perfect way to you know change certain attributes, but also ensure the quality of the final generation. Yeah, I think in in some sense it's uh, I think it's it's a fundamental question, but my feeling is people more or less gave up on it because they say it's it's and as entangled as it is, we try to do the best uh, we can uh, to 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 you know yeah. to, to do to get the application we would like to work. Uh, that's kind of something that's something we can show that you know it's good enough for certain uh, applications. But talking about applications, I think you showed um, examples where um, you know, lots of application can be done by embedding uh, in the GAN space a uh, certain input image. Now, one, uh, you can achieve something like a you know, ma uh, massive sort of resolution, um, but there's always been a potential uh, risk. Right? So one example you, saw, uh, you show um, is like a very low resolution input, but the ground truth essentially that the person is, uh, had mouth closed, but the generation actually had mouth open in, you know, a few slides back. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, can you still find the slide, slides, by the way? Hmm. Can we go back? Yeah, it's a super resolution example. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that's right. I think, yeah, the last example. So I think the input is so low resolution, it's pretty hard to tell whether the mouth is open or closed. Um, and, and clearly, obviously, the reconstruct looks uh, convincing, but uh, obviously, a bit still a bit different from the from the ground truth. Yeah. So the 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 ground truth is 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 mainly shown as some other comparable quality um, comparable quality um, you know interpretation of the lower resolution model and then it's, it's not a real ground truth then well no it, i mean it is the ground truth but there are many possible interpretations for the low resolution yeah. so we yeah. just know that this is one possible interpretation that is valid. And the, 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 the ground truth will have a better fit to the low resolution, uh, of course. Um, but in some sense, it should be possible to find other valid images that correspond to this low resolution mm -hmm. model, not only the, you know, the ground truth is more where we got it from. Yeah, sure. I mean, given the loss of information, it's uh, you'll, you'll pose problem. So certainly there won't be a unique uh, answer that, that tick all the boxes and that, that's a correct reconstruction of the of the input. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess for other cases where you do again embedding, there's always a kind of subtle changes as you mentioned in the previous slides. Um, yes. So, yeah. so the, 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 GAN, the GAN is mainly good if you give it some freedom to mm. uh, to cheat a bit, it is not good for very precise operations. So even sure. for even for you know you have this uh, let's say colorization, the image gets colorized, but it's not no longer exactly the same as the input. So for example the the woman on the top row, it had an earring mm. in the gray scale, a nose ring mm. in the gray scale that all the GAN colorizations ignore uh, and then remove. So um, it's in some sense, uh, it again needs this freedom to cheat a bit to get the quality it, it can mm. it, it gets. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's you know, the rare feature in the training data in this particular case. Um, so, you know, given this, um, you know, this flexibility, would that be possible for the scan algorithm to generate multiple outputs for the same inputs, which are all plausible, or the or only tend to just to generate one without they believe to be the best? Yes. So that's that's uh, that's definitely possible, but as far as I know, um, people have not had no no one had great success to do it. So you can see some examples in papers, not, not only ours, but these examples are always worse than you would like them to be. And I think yeah. part of the problem is that the optimization algorithm itself biases the results. For example, many people initialize with the 
uh, center of the latent space. And uh, then you just don't get the variations you want. And even if you then use different initializations, then, then maybe the quality goes down. So it's possible, but overall people have not been uh, super successful in getting di many different variations. Uh, thanks very much. Um, any, any questions? Any more questions from the audience? Any chance for the, the, the last minute question? Okay, if you don't have more questions, um, let's thank uh, Peter uh, again for, for the really nice talk. I think you know, uh, lots of ins uh, you know, really interesting insights in, into this problem. Uh, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you.